tanks, a symbol of strength and fighting power, fearsome and destructive. Just because something's scary doesn't mean you can't be interested in it. Sometimes evil is particularly attractive. Hardly any other invention has influenced warfare in the 20th century as much as the tank. It decided battles and changed the psychology of war. There is nothing like a tank that you meet in civilian life. Its real purpose is there as a killing machine. Used against their own people, they became tools of oppression. When technology and violence come together, they have a very attractive mixture for pop culture, for things like model making, for leisure activities. Has the weapon of the century lost its significance today? What role does the tank play in the 21st century? Over a hundred years ago, tanks rolled onto the battlefields of the First World War for the first time. It was a revolutionary weapon. The steel track driven behemoths were designed to overcome the enemy's trenches while protecting their own crew from the enemy's cannon fire. What the tank brings, it's what every soldier's always wanted through history. It's about mobility, it's about some form of weapon, the firepower, and some form of protection. And even an infantryman with some body armor on, they're all the things that they want. What the tank does is it does it at speed and it does it in a sort of an enlarged manner. So in a sense, it, it's boiling down an essence of the military that's been around for a long time. Malwinkel in Saxony-Anhalt. On a former Soviet military base, army tanks are rolling on peaceful missions. Driving a tank has become recreational pastime. Twelve years ago, people established a tank driving school here. The vehicles are from the inventory of the GDR and the former Warsaw Pact. First of all, when they arrive, they've demilitarized, which means they have huge holes in them. We are allowed to patch them with standard sheet metal, which means we can weld them together with much thinner material, and then of course they look really bad. Once they are welded, they are sandblasted, then painted again, and minor repairs are performed. You never buy a finished perfect product, but they have been discarded from an army somewhere. It is almost exclusively men who succumb to the fascination of tanks. The decommissioned war equipment has its own very special charm. Anyone who has a bit of a feel for technology is fascinated by tanks. The power, the military strength, no matter whether you're militaristic or a pacifist, it's just impressive. And, of course, the noise and this monster-like appearance are really impressive. After a short introduction, the student driver is allowed to put the tank, which was developed in the Soviet Union, in motion. Later, they receive commands from the driving instructor via the so-called tank helmet. The 200 hectare site is an adventure playground for adults with vehicles designed for destruction. That's what makes it so attractive. <laughs> 
You can still see them live here, not like in a museum. You can touch them, hear the sound. You can also experience the feel and what it's like to be driving a chunk of armor with the earth trembling and that it is incredibly great when you sit behind the wheel and you proudly operate it yourself. The Czech infantry fighting vehicle with a weight of 13 tons and 300 horsepower is one of the lighter examples. Other models weigh up to 50 tons. I still know how to drive a good old Trabant, but a tank doesn't drive like that, it's completely different, because everything is so slow. Fortunately, you drive three laps, and during the second lap you slowly get the grip, and by the third you understand how it works. In the beginning you just lurch back and forth, but then it works, and then it's even more fun. Tanks made their first major appearance over a hundred years ago in Cambrai in northern France. It was on November the 20th, 1917, that machines fought against machines for the first time. Cannons against steel colossuses. That battle in the First World War was the first major tank offensive in the history of mankind. This battle at Cambrai demonstrated the true effectiveness of tanks. However, there were enormous losses. After two or three days, only about 50 of the initial 350 tanks were able to continue fighting. For the first two days of the Battle of Cambrai, it's seen as a great success. For the first time in the war, the church bells are rung in England to announce a success. So this is considered the sort of saving moment for the tanks. At the time, the front lines between Germany and France had been mostly at a standstill for more than three years. Millions of soldiers had been killed in pointless trench warfare. By using tanks, the British offensive hoped to break through the German positions. The British tanks reached their final destination, but were completely burned out. The same gains they made with the tanks the Germans got back in a few days with their foot soldiers. What the British achieved was that they had saved blood. They had made those gains with less loss of life, and that is the essential lesson from Cambrai. For the Germans, Cambrai is important because, first of all, it was a bad wake-up call for them. After Cambrai, it was clear that the tank would be a key weapon system. Ideas for armoured vehicles had been floating around long before the start of the First World War. Gunter Bursten, an Austrian army officer, developed the first plans for a modern all-terrain battle tank as early as 1911. His motor gun, however, was never built. The groundbreaking idea of the continuous track belongs to an American. Old Caterpillar had been manufacturing heavy agricultural machinery in the US since the 1890s. The vehicle's rotating track ensured that the machines could move better over unpaved terrain. At the beginning of the First World War, his track vehicles inspired a British officer named Ernest Swinton. He advanced the idea of using armored tractors from Holt as combat vehicles. However, this attempt failed. It was the then naval officer Winston Churchill who was so convinced of the idea of armored land ships that he set up a special committee for their development the Landship Committee. 
Churchill has seen the benefit of armoured vehicles and he starts pushing the Royal Navy to try and create something that even at the time they were calling it a land battleship. And the army says, if we're going to build something like a tank, it's not called a tank yet, um, it's going to have to cross a six foot wide German trench. It's got to have certain characteristics. They end up putting these ideas together and they come up with a prototype. The prototype is called Little Willy. Little Willy was the first rote worthy tank in the history of warfare. It was ready for testing by the end of 1915. After modifications and the construction of a second prototype, Big Willy, with a completely circulating track, serious production could begin. The first operational tank, which would later become the Mark I, was born. The British rolled the first tank onto the battlefield, and this fact has secured them a place in the history books, so to speak. The first tank was British. The fact is, however, that the French, as an armoured nation, were at least as important as the British throughout the war. France, the small town of Saumur, lies a good 300 kilometres southwest of Paris, in the department of Mernet Loire. Besides a legendary castle and its wines, the town on the Loire is famous as a former training centre for cavalry. Today, the French Ministry of Defence maintains one of the world's largest tank museums here, the Musée des Blindés. Outside, steel witnesses of two world wars. With more than 800 exhibits, the museum commemorates military conflicts since the invention of the tank. But the discarded steel behemoths are not intended for disarmament. They will be restored and made roteworthy again. The specialists are working on a German Panzerkampfwagen 5, a model from 1943. The so-called Panther was fast and powerful, but its engine often had problems. The engines used were often ship's engines, so they were very large, because you needed an enormous amount of power for the drivetrain. Lieutenant Colonel Garnier du Labarriere is curator and head of the museum. It's definitely more complicated than the American engines. You can see why they lost the war. The museum's director is particularly proud of a French model, the Renault FT. It's one of the most successful tanks from the First World War. He also restored it from scratch. 80,000 visitors come to the museum every year to see combat vehicles like these. Just because something is frightening doesn't mean you can't be interested in it. Sometimes evil is particularly attractive. People often say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And these machines of destruction, when they were in use, might trigger a certain fascination among the visitors. That's why they come to the tank museum. Even the small, compact Renault FT is still roteworthy. From Saumur, it is on loan in Paris for a special mission. It is intended to commemorate France's tank building tradition at an armaments fair. Its career began in the First World War. At almost the same time as the British, French military engineers had been working on armoured combat vehicles. After first attempts with large, heavy models, they developed the light, all-terrain Renault in 1916 and ordered 3,500 of them in 1917, a mini-tank barely bigger than an automobile. I've always had a lot of admiration for the pioneers. 
I've always admired the pioneers very much. The Renault FT light tank is an exceptional tank, especially because it's the first one, with all its strengths and weaknesses, which made it possible to develop the current, more powerful tanks. Only two men are needed to operate the Renault FT. The commander sits directly above the driver and transmits his signals by foot. A tap left on the shoulder means drive left. A tap on the right means drive right. And a tap on the head means stop. But as simple as the communication in the vehicle is, the rest of the vehicle is just as ingenious. It's a light, fast tank, mass-produced, and it has a difference. It's got a turret. Not all tank models had that until then. And here, the French industry also found a bit of a place for itself and went in a direction that was really groundbreaking. Before the first British tanks were completed in 1916, soldiers for the new weapon had to be found and trained. This proved to be difficult, as very few men had experience with motor vehicles, let alone the technical know-how. The tank troop didn't yet exist as a kind of weapon, but volunteers were sought, and these volunteers were drafted from the entire army, which was actually a relatively wild bunch. There were probably very few people who could actually drive a car, but that was no problem. These vehicles were so simply constructed. I think it was more demanding in 1914 to drive a horse-drawn carriage than to drive a tank. It could be learned. It was a new system. There was a weapon with which one saw a chance to win the war, to win the battle as well. It offered potential protection, and there were things like better food and more holidays. And there was also the possibility of potential advancement with the new weapon, so there would be promotions and medals. Those were the motivations the soldiers had. The German soldiers were completely surprised when, early in the morning on September 15th in 1916, a vehicle rolled out of the fog towards them. It was the first tank attack in world history. The steel colossuses rolled over grenade funnels, barbed wire and trenches, and couldn't be stopped by machine guns or hand grenades. But the tanks were not invulnerable. For the tank crews, it was barely tolerable inside. They are terribly cramped spaces. You have the engine right in the middle. Once the engine runs for about half an hour, the exhausts that run up to the roof, they glow red hot. So it's a very hot space. There is no suspension, no springs at all on the vehicle. So everywhere you go, you're going to be flung around the place all the time. Um, the engine also leaks carbon monoxide into the cab. So what they found during the course of a day's battle, the crew were quietly getting poisoned. This sometimes meant that the crews had to stop, that they'd pass out, that they had to open the hatches to ventilate the cab. They could hardly see. They could only see through very small slots what was going on outside. You couldn't communicate with each other. You had to yell at each other, to really scream in their ear. And even that often didn't work out. All in all, it was a completely impossible work situation. You could almost say it's the forecourt to hell inside those tanks. With the appearance of the British Mark I tanks on the battlefield, a new era began in the history of warfare. Although neither the French nor the British succeeded in changing the front line on that day, the new weapon had a great effect. A shock for the German soldiers. We have reports in the sources about the first tank attack that show that the soldiers didn't understand what was rolling toward them. You could imagine that it was like some sort of extraterrestrial thing rolling towards them, and it was farm boys from the rural areas who could not figure out at all what was coming their way. But at the same time, it was clear it was attacking them and trying to kill them. <laughs> 
It was unstoppable, and an important psychological aspect of it was that this rolling, the tracks that were rolling towards you, threatened to roll over and crush you. It's a very violent psychological thing. The unstoppability of this malicious object, and this is also the point, it's an object, a machine, something soulless. That really shocked a lot of soldiers at that moment. Not only were the simple soldiers shocked by the tank, but so were the commanders-in-chief of the German army who hadn't expected the effect of this new miracle weapon. A tank shock took place in the military leadership as well as the political leadership, because now there was something new, and in this war it was rather unusual that the opponent came up with something that was not available on their own side. So of course this immediately triggered activity as well as unrest on the German side. In the First World War, the Germans repeatedly captured British tanks that had broken down or had been shot. The hijacked vehicles provided important insights into their opponents' weapon technology. The tanks were used by the German military not only to help build their own tank forces, but also as a source of ideas for technical developments. By the autumn of 1917, they had a relatively large number of British tanks, so why not just rebuild them? Probably because they had already started building their own. As early as November 1916, the Supreme Army Command had developed a German tank. The result? The A7V a mighty 30-ton steel colossus driven by an 18-man crew. Maximum speed, 16 kilometers per hour. Only 20 of the 38 Sturmpanzerwagen, which were originally ordered, were built. There wasn't enough steel to build more. The Germans had no access to the world market as a result of the blockade that had been placed around the German Reich. That meant they had precious few raw materials. They could have put iron and special rare metals and so on into the tanks, but the same raw materials were also being used for submarines, and the submarines were already an established weapon. Back then, armaments always meant having to choose between different options, because resources were of course not unlimited, and armor itself was not a priority in 1917 either, because the tank had not been a success story until then. But in England, where the citizens made a decisive contribution to the financing of the new miracle weapon through war loans, its use was celebrated with euphoria. The British felt technologically superior and declared the use of the tank a success. The tank becomes a huge propaganda success in Britain and the British public sort of fall in love with the tank. Um, we end up in Britain, there's a dance called the Tanko, you could buy a handbag for the ladies, shaped like a tank. Um, all sorts of things were going on to celebrate the fact that we had this new uh, special weapon. The British, like the other nations, were of course under the impression that the war that had become so bogged down was hopeless. And the tank, whether one knew of details or not, offered at least the promise that there would be some means of ending this war. It wasn't that important if it would really work. You had something to believe in again, a focus of hope. They then take tanks round to all the British cities to help raise money for the war effort. And they get to the point one city's rivaling another with how much money they've made. The tank became a hit. Began the cat's pillar crawl, and the 
The symbolic power of the tank depends, of course, on the outcome of the war, so it's very different from country to country. For the Germans, symbolic power did not develop at first. The Germans built a few tanks and used a lot of captured ones, but there was never any real tank enthusiasm in Germany. The horror of war had deeply buried itself in the hearts of returning German soldiers. They had all risked their lives. The massive experience of violence had shaped them. Only a few of them had gone up against tanks in battle. Toxic gas, severe shell splinters and scrap metal injuries had left traces on the body and soul of the man. The doctors had never seen such terrible wounds. Many soldiers suffered from sleep disorders, panic attacks or paralysis. But not all men were visibly wounded. At the time, neurologists considered the soldiers' symptoms to be weakness of will and effeminacy. The only aim of their treatment was to get them back to the front line as quickly as possible. But the men couldn't overcome the tank shock. We know that many soldiers said it was especially bad because this machine seemed so soulless. You can understand a human opponent, the other soldier, he's like you, that also makes it harder to kill him, but at least you understand him. The machine, however, is cold, it's unstoppable and aggressive. A war triptych by Otto Dix. Like many artists, he volunteered for the front in the First World War. But the reality of the trenches quickly disillusioned him. He captured in pictures what he experienced on the battlefields. He drew and painted what war does to man. The only artist who captured the new wonder weapon in a picture was an Englishman, the war painter Christopher Nevinson. The War Propaganda Bureau had sent him to the Western Front in 1917 as an official war painter. But he too not only celebrated the new propaganda weapon, but also captured the downside. With the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, the First World War ended on paper according to international law. Further development of the tank was controversially discussed by the Allies. The English and French scrapped some of the thousands of tanks they produced and used the steel for civilian purposes. The Germans had no choice. The Treaty of Versailles prohibited them from developing new weapons. In the interwar period, this led to the fact that the Germans, first of all, had an extreme focus on tanks when they saw that the others had something that they no longer had. They had forbidden it to us, therefore it had to be important. So this Versailles effect did not lead the Germans to say, well, it's forbidden to us, we no longer have to deal with it. It was exactly the opposite. Because it was forbidden to them, they focused on it intensively. They mounted wooden and sheet metal armor on cars and did maneuvers with them. The German military intensively studied British treatises on the war. Their aim was to test new strategies for the future use of tanks. While England and France were disarming in the 1920s, the Reichswehr was already training for the next war on that model. The Germans tried to keep up with the development of mobile warfare, even though they had no tanks. The thought was always, 
that tanks would one day be really reliable and fast. And that was in the mid-1920s, when the technological development was already so far advanced that it was foreseeable that they could cover long distances on the battlefield. They would be able to act autonomously, and somehow you had to get a grip on that. You had to write down the rules of the game. You had to get into the heads of the soldiers. And that's why they built these dummies during maneuvers to do a flanking maneuver and to surprise a battalion or a regiment that practiced from the side. That's exactly what tanks did in the Second World War. Fast flank movements into the side of the opponent, and the young soldiers of the Reichswehr had that ready. They were used to it by using these dummies. Hitler in particular saw the tank as the weapon of the future and in 1935 openly continued the hitherto secret armament. In the 1930s, after Hitler took power, and with the rearmament of the Wehrmacht, the situation shifted. That's when the tank became a central weapon of the Wehrmacht. By the beginning of the 1930s, German companies had secretly resumed the forbidden production of arms. Companies such as Daimler-Benz, Krupp, MAN and Rheinmetall. It was lucrative business for the privately organized defense industry in Germany. They built the tank combat vehicles one and two, light tanks, six to nine tons heavy and based on the French Renault FT model. The one equipped with a turret. Serious production began in 1937. The first German tanks, which were already being built from 1933 onward, were vehicles where the main thing was to produce as many as possible as quickly as possible. In the Soviet Union, tank production in the 1930s was based on the same principle. Industrialized armament began when Stalin seized power. After the dictator had carried out his relentless purges within the party, he then took on the Red Army. He had countless leaders eliminated, replaced them with compliant successors, and massively expanded the armed forces. The Red Army grew from around 600,000 soldiers in 1930 to just under a million in 1934. Stalin also advanced the production of armaments, especially tanks, thus further expanding his power apparatus. In the Soviet Union, a combination of several factors came together that quickly made the country one of the most important tank builders and tank utilizers. Basically, the communist ideology loved the machine, so all mechanization was good. That is why the communists also paid very close attention to tanks, because they said, that suits our way of thinking, that's what we want. The whole thing was then underpinned with the ideas of Stalin with the rapid industrialization. As a result, the Soviet Union, he captured in pictures, suddenly built more tanks in the 1930s than all the other nations put together. With the Wehrmacht's attack on Poland on September the 1st, 1939, Adolf Hitler unleashed World War II and justified it with a lie. Only a few months later, in May of 1940, Hitler gave the order to attack in the West. Blitzkrieg was what German propaganda called the war plan with which the Wehrmacht overran the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg and France in just a few days. Completely by surprise, German tank divisions invaded the forest trails of the Ardennes, which were considered insurmountable. The fast pace of advance and the good interactions of the tank troops helped the Germans to break through. One of the key things for tank crews is that sense of fighting together. You're a team. You've got to be effective as a team if you're going to be successful in battle. 
there is that claustrophobia, that sense of um, you're going to know the guy who's sitting with you, what he had for breakfast. So that sense of you're all in it together and you rely on each other if you're going to be an effective tank crew. In contrast to British and French tanks, German tanks already had radio communication. A decisive advantage in tactical manoeuvres. The vulnerability of the tanks in combat was the same on both sides. Soldiers in tanks know best how vulnerable this steel box in which they were sitting is. On the one hand, it was of course very nice to have armoured steel around you, that was reassuring. Then again, you were of course a large block of steel driving on the battlefield and both sides knew, both the tank crew and the defending crews with guns, that you had to be eliminated. That is, one was protected on the one hand, but at the same time one drew fire on oneself. Everything depends on the type of grenade and where it hits the tank and from what distance it is fired. Although the Allies had more and sometimes better tanks in the Western campaign, they could not stop the German tank divisions. There were losses on both sides and it quickly became clear to all involved the tank is not only the new miracle weapon, it also quickly becomes a death trap. If you're hit, is to get out of that tank quickly. Um, they're trained to actually evacuate a tank in three to five seconds. If you were penetrated and the engine caught fire, one of the major issues is not just the petrol, but it's also actually setting fire to the ammunition. And the last thing you want to be is in a tank if it's set on fire. Um, I spoke to a veteran once and he said we could hear another tank crew, their radio was on send when the men were burning. And he said after that we went into action with our pistols on our laps because we certainly were never going to be in a tank that was burning. We'd rather shoot ourselves. This fear was intensified by the fact that the soldiers could see practically nothing. One had side slots, one could look out, but of course they mostly only gave you a very narrow field of vision. To be protected as a soldier and at the same time to defeat the enemy ranks quickly and forcefully, that was the promise of the tank in the First World War. The fact it's got that firepower and shock action as it's going forward as well, that really brings something new to the battlefield. By the beginning of the Second World War, at the latest, the firepower of tanks had become the decisive characteristic of the steel weapon. Larger cannons with more range and penetration were used. Tanks were particularly successful if they did not lose mobility and armour despite their firepower. In the Swiss canton of Aargau, almost 150 kilometres north of the Swiss capital of Bern, lies the small municipality of Fullreuntal. Here in the tank museum, a special myth is brought to life. A German King Tiger tank from the Second World War. One of the few still existing German main battle tanks, the Tiger II. Up till the end of the war, only 492 units were built. Since 2007, a team led by Christian Hug, historian and a professional officer in the Swiss Army, has been restoring the legendary super tank from the Second World War in his spare time. Their goal, to make the Tiger optically perfect and technically fully functional. At the end of the restoration work, the Tiger should again be ready to drive. It is a kind of conveying history, in order to actually confront people with history, that one makes history experienceable to a certain extent, as far as one can. To read in a book how a tank worked is one thing, but when you then see one in front of you, hear it, 
feel how the ground vibrates when the thing comes driving by, that leaves a completely different impression. A second cannon supplies the spare parts of the 8.8 cm original cannon, the most powerful tank cannon in World War II. Screws no one has loosened since the war. There are hardly any spare parts left. Certain parts which were standard with all German tanks were the same. For example, lamps and instruments can sometimes still be found. And with certain parts, which really no longer exist, we have to find originals in other museums, where perhaps by chance the one part is still preserved, which has been missing or was in a poor condition. Then one can take measurements, and that actually allows you to reconstruct one that is true to the original again. <laughs> In the spring of 1942, the Tiger first entered the prototype stage, here on a test track at the vehicle manufacturer Henschel. Until then, the Panzerkampfwagen 1 and 2 were the backbone of the German divisions. They were especially fast. But Hitler demanded tanks with greater penetrating power and commissioned Ferdinand Porsche to develop a super tank. The Tiger, Hitler's prestige object. Thick armor and a large cannon should make the vehicle particularly strong. The Tiger I quickly became a myth. With only about 1,300 manufactured units, the heavy main battle tank's reputation already preceded it. If the opposing soldiers saw this distinctive shape, they knew what was coming. Namely, not any German tank, but this very heavy, very powerful and very difficult to eliminate Tiger tank. And that had a very negative psychological effect on the opposite side. There are reports, and they are credible, that tanks, medium tanks, withdrew when they recognized a Tiger rolling towards them, which was reasonable. Accordingly, German propaganda used the super tank for its own purposes. Pretending there were thousands of them when there were none was part of the program. Scarcely 500 copies of the Königstigers were built between 1944 and 45. The Tiger is a classic symbol of power. German propaganda is obviously, it emphasizes the mechanized part of the German military. So let's look at our tanks, let's look at our aeroplanes. What German propaganda doesn't always do, of course, is wait for the rest of the German military to come up the road. You know, 80% of German transport in World War II was still on horseback, and we tend to forget that. But of course, the propaganda will emphasize the latest equipment, such as Tiger tanks, and it also tried to build up heroes for the German people. German propaganda exploited the successes of the Wehrmacht in a film. It presented the French campaign as a motorized Sunday drive accompanied by a tank song. In the film, General Guderian's tank divisions are described as the spearhead of the German military. A single tank is very difficult to use as a propaganda object, but the NS propaganda used the tank weapon as a whole, that is the performance of the tanks at the front, very strongly as a propaganda medium. Because tanks always have this fascination, which the NS had for modern and antiquated things. They had modern weapon systems, engines, gears, cannons, everything very progressive. And ancient, this war elephant, the fighting pig. The King Tiger in the Vollrointal Museum arrived in Switzerland from Germany or France 
after the end of the war. It is on permanent loan from the Swiss Army. Its history is largely unknown. The men only know that their copy was delivered to the German troops in September of 1944. Original plans no longer exist. A lot of detective work and ingenuity are necessary to restore the tiger to its true original state. Technical solutions have to be found by trial and error and manual dexterity. The hinge of a hatch is stuck. Heat should make the steel flexible again. What fascinates me is, of course, the legend of the almighty tiger. But also there's the technology, because that's a Maybach engine. And if I'm correct, it was actually a racing engine or an aircraft engine. And how they put it in a tank like that with all the technology and the transmission linkage, I find that fascinating, especially for back then. Today you have systems for customizing and CAD. Back then everything was created with drawings. Yes, it was impressive. The work on the Panzerkampfwagen 6, the King Tiger, which was considered invincible, is also educational for another reason. If you see what the tanks looked like at the beginning of the war and what is actually inside this vehicle, you can see all the basic features of modern battle tanks as they are still used today and which were actually already inside here. In July 1941, the German Wehrmacht invaded the Soviet Union with a total of 3 million soldiers and around 3,600 tanks. At that time, Stalin had the largest tank army in the world with around 20,000 combat vehicles. But the Soviet tank soldiers were less well trained and in the first months of the war were defeated by opponents who were tactically more experienced. The Germans advanced without opposition. The warfare in the Second World War with tanks changed the moment when the tank became mechanically more reliable. It could drive much further, it could drive faster, it could drive more reliably. This meant that the tank division had to carry everything with it, so that it could really operate far on the battlefield, 50, 200, 300 kilometers ahead. And that meant it also needed trucks or armored infantry fighting vehicles and so on. That happened in 1940-41 and changed warfare, because now it was possible to suddenly cover long distances again, fighting, forming cauldrons, making flanking movements, everything that was typical in the 19th century of cavalry with long marches. It had ended in the First World War, but then it was possible again. An ace in the Russian dictator's sleeve was the T-34, an extremely powerful vehicle that the Germans had not expected. That Soviet tank quickly became a fearsome opponent. In the summer of 1941, it was considered the best tank in the world. The T-34 is interesting because it completely escaped German discovery until Germany invaded the Soviet Union. It was a disaster for the intelligence services. After the German invasion, Stalin moved the tank factories in the west behind the Urals. Production of the successful T-34 model was steadily increased. With over 50,000 units made, the T-34 was the most mass-produced tank of the Second World War. These combat vehicles left the factory in ever-increasing numbers and provided supplies for the Red Army. The T-34 tank starts losing things during the course of the war um, just so they can make more of them quickly. Uh, they look crude, but they're effective. Um, perhaps the best analogy is the Russians in World War II looked at a, a T-34 tank like we might look at a hand grenade. It's a munition that's uh, usable almost once, and then we get another one. 
Hitler's planned lightning campaign against the Soviet Union turned into a murderous war of annihilation that lasted for years. By 1943 at the latest, the German defeat in the East was sealed. The Soviet campaign marked the beginning of the end of the Second World War. Ken Burns and Lynn Novick tell the epic story of the Vietnam War as it's never been told before on film. The complete US version of the Vietnam War, unedited, begins here on PBS America next. Tanks, a symbol of strength and fighting power, terrifying and destructive. Just because something's scary doesn't mean you can't be interested in it. Sometimes evil is particularly attractive. Hardly any other invention has influenced warfare in the 20th century as much as the tank. It has decided battles and changed the psychology of war. There is nothing like a tank that you meet in civilian life. Its real purpose is there as a killing machine. Used against their own people, they became tools of oppression. When technology and violence come together, they have a very attractive mixture for pop culture, for things like model making, for leisure activities. Has the weapon of the century lost its significance today? What role does the tank play in the 21st century? The tank was first used in war at the beginning of the 20th century as a revolutionary weapon. These steel companions were awkward and easily vulnerable. In the Second World War, countries produced more and more powerful tanks. Firepower, mobility and armor increased. Today, modern battle tanks are a high-tech weapon. The tank is really in its infancy in the First World War experimented with in the 1920s and 30s, it shows its full potential in World War II when you've got the idea of not just large numbers of tanks but being used imaginatively to capture ground speedily, cross ground as well that normal infantry would take a long time to get there. Suddenly now we've got something much more effective but doing a similar sort of role and we can do even more with it. 60 kilometers south of Berlin, near Gut Kummersdorf, lies an almost secret place in the Märkische Forest. It is the army test facility Kummersdorf. Two world wars were prepared from here. Rockets, ammunition and tanks were all tested on the site. And in this assembly hall, Hitler's last wonder weapon was to be assembled. The world's heaviest ever tank, with a codename Maus. Weight, 188 tons, over 10 meters long, 3.7 meters wide, and designed for a crew of six. The Panzerkampfwagen 8 was more of a fortress than a tank. 150 of the so-called Maus were built. The area is still secret today. Only those who have a legitimate interest in research, such as military historian Markus Pöhlmann, can enter the site. The hall here is actually intended for dismantling and assembling this vehicle in trial operations. You have to understand that it weighs almost 190 tons. The turret alone is so heavy that you can't lift it with a normal truck-mounted crane. So you need technicians and equipment familiar with ship bridge construction from a shipyard. And for this, you need a hall that can even house such a crane.
vorhält. In January of 1943, Hitler awarded the design contract to Ferdinand Porsche. By May the 1st, he was able to show him a wooden model of the mouse. The weight of the tank had increased so much due to the 220 mm thickness of reinforced armor that it could only be driven using a 1080 horsepower engine. Maximum speed, 13 kilometers an hour. Built by Alket in Berlin, the mouse was taken by train to Kummersdorf for testing. The turret was to be built here in the assembly hall. Its weight alone was 55 tons. The hall itself was never finished. In 1944, all orders for the construction of super heavy tanks were discontinued. For this vehicle, every river crossing was an obstacle because no bridge could sustain its weight, so they had to disassemble it and bring it to the combat area where they could quickly reassemble and deploy it. But an immobile tank may not be a tank at all. The Maushalle, the Maus Hall, is not the only ruin at the Kummersdorf site. A good 4,000 other buildings are located in the entire area. Another one in the immediate vicinity of the Maushalle is the so-called Klimahalle. Here, vehicles were exposed to extreme climatic conditions. Temperatures of minus 20 degrees Celsius were generated in the hall. And in the dust chamber, temperatures reached over 40 plus degrees. A war where you want to achieve world domination usually takes place in several climate zones. The dangers for the tank are dust. Of course, this is always a problem for the carburetor. It's also problematic for the drive, the track. You have to be able to simulate these climate conditions in order to make the vehicle suitable for war. When the Eastern Front Line reached Berlin in the spring of 1945, the Wehrmacht blew up the two prototype tanks. The Red Army captured the racks and used the remains to construct a new mouse. This one-of-a-kind prototype of the super tank is now in the Kubinka Museum near Moscow. In 1944, the Allies prepared for their offensive in Normandy. Large quantities of troops, weapons and supplies were concentrated there. The further the Allies pushed the Hitler's troops back, the more the Wehrmacht had to deal with the US M4 Sherman tank. A large-scale model which included parts from US automobile production. Together with the T-34, it is the most built tank of the Second World War. Compared to the heavy German tanks, the US tank made up for its weaknesses with a high production rate and ease of repair and maintenance. The sheer mass of American combat vehicles impressed the enemy. that symbolic power of the tank is more than just what it does on the battlefield. It's a fact it looks like it's industrial might, it looks like power, and there's very little you can do against it. And from the first day it appears, the tank, that sense of just its sheer presence can dominate an enemy or make him decide that's the moment I'm going to give up. The German leadership had not considered giving up until the end. Although the armaments industry could barely keep up with demand, the production of Panzerfaust 
ran at full speed until the end. In the last four months of the war alone, two million of them were made, a deadly threat to Allied tanks. German reserves march on. Equipped with all weapons, they move into their locations. In deployments, the men wait with the bazooka. The deadly enemies of the American Sherman tanks are the Panzerfaust grenadiers. That's how they use their weapons. And that's how they work. It always looks the same when rocket shells of the anti-tank weapons have torn steel walls apart. But for the American Shermans, it is not all resistance that they run into. For the oppressed of war, the tank becomes a liberator. If you're being liberated by a tank, you've got very different attitudes to that vehicle if it's freeing you from oppression. So you can look at a tank in very different ways depending on how it's being used uh, and what circumstance you particularly are in at that time. If you look at tanks going through Europe, liberating France, Belgium, um, everyone comes out, they write their names on the side of the tank, they, they don't look at them as being a weapon of oppression, they see them as a symbol of liberation. So again, you see, we can, we can see the same item depending on how, what end of the barrel you're at sometimes, if you see what I mean, you know, that can give you a very different impression. This might be the thing that freed my country, or it might be the thing that parks on the front lawn um, that oppresses me. The invention of the atomic bomb represented a turning point in warfare. The Americans in particular neglected the further development of their tanks in favor of the new nuclear weapon. In Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the US destroyed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people by dropping the bomb. The age of the atomic bomb was a real challenge for the tank for a long time. The big turning point in the Cold War for the tank came with MAD, that is Mutual Assured Destruction. At that moment, when mutual annihilation was assured, both sides were thinking, well, now we could reactivate other options again. We do not want a total nuclear war, so we'll allow smaller outsourced conflicts. These famous proxy wars, and even if it escalates in Europe, then we do that in stages, before we reach for the big red button. And that's how the tank became important again, because as a modern means of combat, it was the chief weapon after the Second World War, which would continue to spearhead conventional wars. In the Korean War between 1950 and 53, the tank again proved its military value. The US realized that they still needed tanks. Similar to divided Germany, Korea was also under the rule of the superpowers US and Soviet Union after the Second World War. It was divided into South and North Korea, which fought continuously at the border. The national conflict developed into an international proxy war. The Americans sent the powerful M46 Patton into battle. There's still that issue about when you're driving down the road. The Americans, for example, they paint great big tiger teeth, a face on the front of their tank because, they're, again, they're trying to show to the cow, local population or people that might be against it, this is something big and powerful. After three years of bloody fighting, the war ended with a ceasefire and the division of Korea. The Korean War was a kind of saving grace for the tank, even though it hadn't played a major role in recent years, and that's because the atomic bomb could not be used in Korea due to the lack of large settlements and industrial areas. Fortunately, the Americans certainly thought about doing so, but there were simply no objectives, and so as early as 1950, when the atomic bomb seemed to be the panacea for many military conflicts, it was already clear, no, it isn't always. And that saved the tank again over time, so to speak. Almost at the same time the Korean War hadn't ended, a popular uprising threatened the Soviet-occupied part of Berlin. With a general strike, the citizens of the GDR protested against the increase of the labor norm. 
On June 17, 1953, they took to the streets in Berlin and more than 700 other towns and municipalities to protest against the SED regime. They still had no idea that here too, eight years after the end of the war, the tank would play a role again. Tanks, where we see them on the streets being used against their own population, that sense of the tank becoming a symbol of an authoritarian power, it's kind of the ultimate symbol that um, uh, a government can use against its own people. You've crossed a line if you use your tank against your own people. Among the demonstrators in Berlin was Joachim Rudolf, who was 14 years old. The last time he had seen tanks was at the end of the war. Joachim Rudolf was a pupil in eighth grade. He was not in school on June the 17th, 1953. In the evening, he heard on Westrundfunk radio about a large-scale demonstration planned for East Berlin. Rudolf arranged to meet a school friend. They wanted to watch the protests together. Of course, we were very curious about how this would take place and what would happen in the city that day, because nobody could have imagined. That's what none of us had experienced. There was a huge hello with the people. They were so happy, they clapped their hands and shouted hurrah and so on. And that infected everyone. We were part of that crowd that was on Marx Engels Square and we thought and felt the same as the other workers and employees. But soon the mood changed. There were calls for free elections. The legitimacy of the SED regime was called into question. The demonstrators broke into the offices of the People's Police and destroyed files. The People's Police were completely overwhelmed. 20,000 Soviet soldiers were deployed for support. There was a dull droning from one side, from the direction of Alexanderplatz, from Rathausstrasse, and suddenly there was screaming, get out, the tanks are coming, the Russians are coming. And at that moment, the first tank came around the corner. It made a hell of a noise. The tanks drove past the Red City Hall to Marx Engelsplatz and then turned right and drove into the crowd standing on Marx Engelsplatz. The demonstrators were powerless against the military. Although the tanks didn't shoot into the crowd, 55 people died as a result of the protests. Here in front, in front of the present new palace building, stood a wooden grandstand, which was later replaced by the Palace of the Republic in the GDR. And as these tanks turned around the corner, a panic rose among the people, who naturally tried to get out of the way of the tanks as quickly as possible. And I was standing in a larger group, fleeing up to the wooden grandstand to get out of the way and make room. And that's when I got lucky, because the tanks drove past us and I didn't experience them anymore. And then I tried to go home as soon as possible, because my mother was of course also afraid, and I was also very afraid. I was 14 years old on that day, and I had not seen any tanks at all since 1945, and that was a very lasting and shocking impression for me. The T-34 tanks of the Soviet Memorial stand for the liberation of Berlin in 1945. For Joachim Rudolf, it's also a reminder of June the 17th, 1953. It was exactly this type, with huge noise caused by the tank engines, huge clouds of smoke coming out of the exhaust pipes. It was exactly this type of tank. It remained in our memory as an object of oppression. Especially in the Western world, it was, of course, an instrument of the Eastern regime, of the Soviets. 
Prague, 1968. Once again, tanks rolled across the streets of a capital city, surrounded by people who had taken to the streets with their dreams of freedom. It was the night of August 20th. The tanks were part of one of the largest demonstrations of military power in Europe since the end of the Second World War. Soviet soldiers were there to stop the Prague Spring, the liberal reform movement of a socialist brother state. By the end of the year, 108 people were dead as a result of the brutal military operation. More than 500 were injured. The tanks destroyed the dream of an entire generation by force. The tank can have a high symbolic value in various contexts, be it for the motivation of one's own people or for oppression, for frightening the opponent. Because unlike airplanes and submarines, it takes place in one's own reality. One is on the same boat as the observer. The plane is always far away. You can imagine a bomb or something, but that's theoretical. The sub might be in the dock or somewhere else, but the tank stands in front of you. And it can also be standing where you are standing in the next moment. It can roll over you. It can take your place. It's next to you in the same world. Beijing, June the 5th, 1989. Tanks had bloodily crashed the peaceful civil protests on Tiananmen Square when suddenly a man with shopping bags stood in their way. The famous Tiananmen Square imagery is so powerful because it's one person being brave enough to stand up to something we all know is big, frightening, powerful, could so easily crush him. And what you actually see is a person being brave enough to try and contact the crew inside so there's a human face talking to a human face. Who was the man who so courageously stood in front of the steel behemoths? His fate is still unknown today, but the images of the tank man went around the world and became an iconic symbol of resistance. When the tank is not being used on the battlefield and is not on manoeuvres, its third role is usually that of a symbol of state power, and most of the time that's what's being interpreted or expressed in parades. The symbolic power of the tanks, their deterrence, had to be demonstrated especially during the Cold War. Military parades were a part of the standard repertoire of socialist countries in particular. Moscow traditionally celebrated its victory over Nazi Germany in front of state guests and World War veterans. But tank parades were also a popular means of demonstrating strength among the Allies in Berlin or the rulers in Beijing. It is this mechanical impression that the parade provides, as if to say, look, this is what this regime, this government, this nation, this army can do. And that is precisely what it was meant to do in the old Eastern Bloc states and in all authoritarian systems. It is quite often a clear warning to all opponents. It doesn't matter whether they're external or internal. It is not only in authoritarian states where rulers show off their military arsenal in parades. The French traditionally celebrate their national holiday with a military parade on the Champs-Élysées. C'est une image de force. That's a very clear picture of strength. The heavy tanks, like the Leclerc, are designs from the 80s. At that time, the Cold War still existed. It had a clear psychological aspect. When you see a steel monster coming towards you, it's always much more frightening than if it were just a small vehicle. It was the same in the GDR, which had a comparatively small tank army. Even there, the tanks traditionally rolled on the day of the Republic. <laughs> 
tanks have been bought by countries that can't maintain them or can't even use them effectively, but they were part of that propaganda. Look, we're the guys with the big stick. From France, General Eisenhower went to the great autumn manoeuvres in northern Germany, in which British Field Marshal Montgomery also took part. Troops from the US, France, Holland, Denmark, Norway and Belgium were also involved in these British manoeuvres. Thus, through such military unions and joint exercises, Europe will be strengthened more and more against any aggression. Since the end of the 1950s, the Federal Republic of Germany had regularly been the scene of major military exercises each autumn by the Western Allies. Their tanks were stationed in Germany. They were maintained all year round and only had to roll onto the roads at the beginning of the maneuver. If the Cold War had become hot, it was always clear that Germany would be the first main battlefield. The American divisions lived and practiced in America, but they had an entire second set of equipment in Germany. In the event of a crisis, and this was practiced in the reforger exercises, the Americans, only the soldiers really, the soldiers would have gotten onto planes and ships, would have come directly to Europe and found everything ready here, and that worked surprisingly well. And that's why tanks always had a readiness level of over 98%. From the beginning, the NATO maneuvers included German participation. The Bundeswehr not only provided soldiers, but also had its own equipment. In this scenario, West Germany was of crucial importance for NATO. The country itself was very small, so it could be overrun quickly. That meant the fight would be going on on this battlefield in any event. For the battle to be won successfully, the power of Germany also had to be tapped. And that is why NATO and the political decision makers of Western Europe allowed Germany to build tanks again relatively early on. The only reason was the threat, the perceived threat, the perceived threat from the Eastern Bloc. With the rearming of the Bundeswehr, tanks were again being built in Germany. The Leopard main battle tank, a powerful vehicle, more than two Volkswagen, wide and long. Unloaded weight, almost 37 tons, which is equal to the weight of 43 Volkswagens. Lightweight sheet metal here, strong armor plating here, turning radius of the Volkswagen, 9 meters 60. Turning radius equals vehicle length. Climbing is difficult for this one. But not for that one. Climbing ability, 40% for the Volkswagen, 60% for the Leopard. Our two unequal brethren in a meter and a half of water. And at two meters, 25. And when everyone else has to swim, the Leopard rolls and rolls underwater and reappears. The Leopard 1, or Leopard 1, was introduced in the summer of 1963. Rheinmetall, Wegmann and Porsche are all involved. In 1979, its successor, the Leopard 2, went into production. Both were successful models that quickly became export hits. They proved to be powerful, mobile, fast and agile. The designers of the Leopard made a decision. We are fully committed to speed and firepower. We deliberately neglected protection. 
The logic at the time was that the Leopard was built or was developed in the early 60s when there were so-called hollow charges. Hollow charges are projectiles of a certain type which were actually able to penetrate armor of any thickness at that time. And that's why the Germans decided it doesn't matter, we won't even try to build even thicker armor. We prefer to build a vehicle that is so fast and so agile that it won't get hit in the first place. And then we'll put a reasonable cannon on it so that it can knock out the enemy. That was the principle and that worked very well. And so the Leopard 1 became a very successful tank. Tank battalion Munster in the Lüneburg Heath. More than 40 years later, the Leopard is still the main tank of instruction for the Bundeswehr. That's the Leopard 2A4 instruction tank. That is the turret, so it's almost all the same. The body is the same, the weight classes are the same, the dimensions are the same. That's why we've got this dummy barrel here too, so that the students learn how to handle the dimensions in the field. Here in front, where the driver's seat would be, what we've done here now is an angled mirror on the left over which the driver would then observe the left area in the terrain. The hatch is now open. That is to say, here you would now see the middle angled mirror and the right angled mirror. And up there we have our driving controls, where I can override the student driver. Before they go out on the track in a real tank, the soldiers practice in the tank simulator. Comrade Köhler, today is your third day and third lesson in the simulator. Today you'll drive off-road, and after safety checks, I'll close the door. The controls in the simulator are identical to those of the tank. The main thing here is to learn the technical details and how to handle the tank. Driver, your commander, how do you read me? I read you well, how do you read me? I read you loud and clear. Driver, off-road readiness. Driver, forward march. So now we already have the first basic job, namely driving over bumps. When we drive down, accelerate, 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 accelerate. Stay on the gas, release the throttle at the top for a moment, and then accelerate again. No, that has to be a flowing movement. More gas now. As we stand on a gradient, more gas. Exactly. Now stay on the gas, stay on the gas, take off and accelerate again. The most difficult thing for the student driver in the beginning is really that he has a lot coming at him. That is, he has to drive completely differently. He has to touch different things. He also has to make a report. He has to ask whether the danger area is clear before starting off. So there is a lot of input in the beginning that the student has to absorb. And then he has to process that. And therefore we have the simulator lessons. A student driver is taking the Leopard 2 off-road today. The soldier is about to take her exam and will have to practice standard situations again. In the terrain, the driver sits under a closed hatch and can only orientate herself via periscope-like window slits, the so-called angle mirrors. The hardest part of driving a tank like this is really because of the angular mirrors, because you only have a small field of vision, which means you have to cover the whole thing. You might also have blind spots to the front. You'll see the bumps, but they come later, so now you really have to put everything together, which is what I see, what I feel, and then the feedback from the vehicle. You really have to concentrate, because there are so many differences to a car. And the weight of 50 tons and 1,500 horsepower also make a substantial difference. I have no problem with narrowness at all, with the angle mirrors. You just have to get used to it. It distorts the real picture a bit. You don't perceive nature that much anymore. You can't see. You go down the hill right now, you only see the sky. 
but otherwise you get used to it pretty quickly. The German tank museum in Münster is located in the immediate vicinity of the barracks. Christian Barth is a hobby commander and passionate tank fan. As a volunteer, he is in charge of the Leopard 1 main battle tank in the museum. Once a month, he takes a look at the almost 40-year-old steel giant and checks to see whether the engine is still running. In addition to the powerful cannon, the museum Leopard is equipped with two machine guns. It fires standard NATO ammunition and takes two types of ammunition. One is the multi-purpose projectile, which is in principle a hollow charge projectile like that of a Panzerfaust III, which is currently in the Bundeswehr. Or I can shoot a kinetic balancing projectile, which is a so-called tungsten arrow, called penetrator, which is simply there to penetrate the armor. Across the street, two colleagues are taking care of an exhibit from Bundeswehr stocks, a Marder infantry fighting vehicle. Lutz Schulze and Michael Hohmeyer are a well-rehearsed team. The two come to Münster regularly to dedicate themselves to the preservation of the Oldtimer. For a long time, the Marder was the main weapon system of the Panzergrenadiertruppe. There is room for up to seven men plus crew in the infantry fighting vehicle. Actually, I've been interested in the Marder since my military service, and it's amazing that you can achieve a lot with a little. It's kind of like a steam locomotive where you can still understand the technology. It's not yet completely automated or digitized like some other combat vehicles in the Bundeswehr. There's still a lot of handiwork involved. The Marder is the first infantry fighting vehicle built in Germany after the Second World War. Protecting the exhibit from damage is one of the tasks of the technically inclined hobby mechanics. Okay, now here I open the engine room hatch, because when we are here every four weeks, we do an engine room check, because we never know what will happen in the long run when we are not here. There can always be some kind of damage, static damage or condensation, or some hoses become leaky or something else. OK, the engine compartment is in order, and now we can start the vehicle. And we do that so that the engine oil flows, so that the engine gets warm, and so that everything moves. The 600 horsepower engine starts without a murmur. The regular maintenance was worth it. Moscow at the end of the 1980s. In the second half of the 80s, there were signs of change in the Soviet Union. The dissatisfaction of the people grew. There were increasingly large shortages of everything for the people. The planned economy, strict command structures and rampant military expenditure weakened the economy of the superpower more and more. President Gorbachev, who came to power in 1985, wanted to change all that. With Glasnost and Perestroika, he wanted to open the economy to private initiatives and involve the population in the political decision-making processes. For decades, arms expenditure had consumed up to a quarter of the Soviet gross national product every year. But Gorbachev's reforms did not bear the desired fruit. By the end of the 80s, the supply situation in the Soviet Union was still catastrophic. At the same time, more and more constituent republics were striving for autonomy and independence. A new treaty on the Soviet Union, which assured the republics more sovereignty, was a thorn in the side of many party members. On August 19 in 1991, communist hardliners tried to force a coup in Moscow against President Mikhail Gorbachev tanks were on the loose in downtown Moscow. But the armed forces refused to follow the coup leaders. The amateurishly organized revolt quickly collapsed. Boris Yeltsin, then president of the Russian Republic, called on the people to resist 
and prevented the overthrow. At the same time, he secured more power for himself. For Gorbachev and the superpower, this was a downfall. It was the end of several years of decay. One year earlier, the soldiers and tanks of the Soviet army stationed in the GDR withdrew. The Soviet Union had stationed 14,000 tanks in the Warsaw Pact states. Suddenly, they seemed superfluous. More than 500,000 people, including war material, left Germany within four years and returned to Russia. The withdrawal was the largest peacetime troop transfer in military history. In the middle of Germany, surrounded by nature parks and agricultural areas, lies the small village of Rockensuska. Europe's largest tank dismantling facility is located in the 200 inhabitant village in the Thuringian province. The last stop for steel giants lined up here for scrapping. More than 500 tanks are waiting to be dismantled in the huge tank cemetery. It takes three to five days to dismantle these behemoths, which can weigh up to 60 tons professionally. In the end, only pieces of between 50 to 100 centimeters remain, which can no longer be assembled. After reunification, Germany had too many tanks. Hundreds of tanks of the former National People's Army were dismantled as part of the agreement. This is easy. This is where we empty the fuel. Between 300 and 600 liters, the lifeblood of the vehicle. I'm not really sorry about the tank anymore, but rather the money they once cost. After all, there's quite a fortune in a tank like that. The technology, I don't want to know what that amounts to. The employees have dismantled around 18,000 armored vehicles since 1991. The different metals are neatly separated from each other. What's left is a pile of metal. In Rockensusra, the tank offers a sad picture, the end of the weapon of the century. The tank came onto the battlefield in 1916 and was already declared obsolete by many people in 1918. It was declared obsolete when the atomic bomb arrived, when suddenly there were the anti-tank guided missiles that the individual soldier could carry. It was declared obsolete in 1990 because the Cold War was over. So what purpose did tanks still serve? The tank was said to be dead every few years, but it didn't disappear. The conflicts of today demonstrate that tanks will not disappear that quickly. Since the outbreak of the Ukraine conflict, it is not just the Baltic EU states that feel threatened by Moscow. In a NATO report classified as secret, the military expressed doubts as to whether the alliance could react quickly enough to a Russian surprise attack. We only have to see in our current times this rebirth of almost a Cold War again has meant that countries that have disposed of their tanks, for example the Netherlands got rid of all its tanks, they're now hiring tanks back in. Uh, Canada did the same thing. So countries are actually reinvigorating their tank programs when not that long ago we thought this was done and dusted. 
The conflicts of the 21st century have also changed the tank. Smaller and modular in design, it has adapted to its new fields of application, like here in Syria. At the same time, the vulnerabilities of the heavy tanks became apparent when they were deployed in urban environments. Statically positioned without support in a unit, they easily become targets themselves. IS fighters allegedly destroyed Turkish armed forces Leopard tanks for the first time. The German flagship tank was previously considered indestructible. If you look at the war in Syria, if you look at the war in Ukraine, then of course you can imagine situations where you say tanks still play a role in the future. Except that they'll play a completely different role in a digitized battlefield, which will look very different to what we have today and what we had in World War II. Paris. In the north of the French capital, just a few minutes from Charles de Gaulle Airport, lies the Villepint Exhibition Centre. The Eurosatery takes place here every two years, the world's most important military trade fair for the defence industry. Over 1,000 exhibitors from around 60 countries present their war material here. There's more armament in the world now than there has been since the Cold War. Last year alone, countries globally spent 1.43 trillion euros on armaments. First and foremost, from the US and China. The hot conflicts of the present heat up the arms spiral. But it's not just about military strength. The arms industry guarantees billion dollar business. Politics and business are closely interlinked. French Secretary of Defense, Florence Parly. The people know each other from the interlinked web of politics, business and the military. Rheinmetall CEO Armin Pappberger presents the latest product from the German tank manufacturer. Rheinmetall has a very proud history as a market innovator and we constantly reinvest to develop new and very innovative products to solve the problems that our customers face on the battlefield of today and of tomorrow. A world premiere for a new generation of battle tanks. The in-house advertising clip documents the self-confidence of the armaments maker. In 2017, Rheinmetall generated sales of 5.9 billion euros with its products. A reason to celebrate as defense budgets continue to rise worldwide. But what role will the tank play in the future? Asking the question what is the role of the tank today is actually wrong. 
the tank has many different roles. If they are sitting somewhere in the Congo and there's a warlord who has a Colton mine, he only needs one T-54 to rule the region. Because if the people who live here don't have a bazooka, an RPG or anything else, then this one ancient Soviet tank is a massive force. There probably won't be any more large tank battles. That's what we always think of, World War II, the Cold War. But as I said, depending on the scenario, a few tanks are still enough. That is the crucial question. Will the tank of the future be like we know it today? Shouldn't another weapon system perhaps replace the tank? I don't have an answer yet. Perhaps the tank of the future will have a completely different shape. Maybe it won't exist anymore. But in any case, there must be a weapon system that allows us to move, shoot and hit the target. Does modern warfare still need tanks? Or has modern warfare long since shifted to cyberspace, where digital societies are most vulnerable? The symbolic power of the tank, its power as a killing machine, but also its fascinating technology, have preoccupied people since its inception. The tank has shaped our image of war. After every conflict, it was declared dead, and yet it emerged stronger and stronger from the crisis. It was born in the First World War, and its development isn't finished, not even after 100 years. Ken Burns and Lynn Novick tell the epic story of the Vietnam War as it's never been told before on film. The complete US version of the Vietnam War, unedited, begins here on PBS America, next.